How's everybody doing? Did you get your coffee this morning? I came in and I woke up, well, I woke up this morning and I don't know if anybody else is dealing with allergies right now, but so if I sound like I'm like weepy or crying, I'm not. I just got a lot of congestion stuff going on right now. So Thanksgiving, Thursday, how was it? Did you stuff yourselves? Yeah, how many of you exercised afterwards? Any, any good ones in the house? Anybody? Okay, we got a couple. Okay, so for the rest of you who didn't exercise, good thing you came to church this morning because all the hand lifting and all that, that was just Christian aerobics, okay? So you can go home and you can say you, you exercise, okay? You're one step ahead. And if you want to get even more, you can come back to the next service and get a little bit more exercise. But that means you actually have to move during worship. You know, you got you to gotta get the bounce going in the, in the hand up. <laughs> so um, a couple weeks ago, um, I took a couple of students up to ORU for college weekend and normally we just go to a college weekend where they stay in the dorms and then Saturday morning we get up really early and we come back so that we can make it for church. Um, this time we decided to stay a little bit longer so we stayed Saturday night and we were able to go to Victory Church in Tulsa and that night um, their, their pastor was preaching on confession and you don't hear a lot um, of messages on confession and it, it really touched me um, so I'm going to bring a message to you that's different than what he said, but it, in that moment, I realized just how amazing confession is. And I think it's a negative term. I think we see confession and we think, you know, I don't, I don't want to do that. I, I'm going to stay away from that. And in, in that moment, at the end of that service, um, they had pieces of paper that they passed down the aisles. And they, they had us write down the things, you know, write a letter to God, basically, and confessing some things that had been going on in our lives. And I didn't actually have a pen that night, so I took out my phone, and um, I, I wrote down in my notes section just a letter to God. And it was very honest. It was brutally honest. And I just was like, God, here are some areas where I have messed up recently. Will you forgive me? Um, and will you allow me to move on for this and heal me from this? And, and you know... I, at the end, everybody took their notes and they went to the altar and they kind of like laid their notes down and, and it was a beautiful moment, but since I didn't have that note and I'm not going to take my phone and go lay it at the altar, I, I just took my notes and I deleted it. And I know that sounds like such a simple gesture, but man, I feel like I walked away from that two or three weeks ago and God healed me from some areas because I, I confessed it and I remembered it no more. And God said, I remember it no more. And so I'm going to talk to you guys about the beauty of confession, and, and not just that it's a scary word, but that you can walk out of this room today and understand that confession is, is something powerful that we should exercise as believers. So um, I want to tell you a little story about um, my life as a teenager. Um, I have dealt with confession a lot, and it's not fun. And a, lo a lot of those times, it wasn't necessarily me confessing. It was my dad finding out about things and me getting caught. So um, I, I want to share a story about one time when I got caught and the, how not to do confession, basically. Um, so I was probably 16, around that age, um, maybe right before I was 16, and I didn't have a phone at that point because, you know, my parents said I couldn't have a phone until I was driving, and so I did not get a phone until my 16th birthday. And I know kids these days, they get them at like 10, and I'm just a little salty about that because I had to wait. So, you know, when I have kids, my kids are going to wait until they're 16 <laughs> because I had to do it. Um, but there was a time when um, I was in school and I had dual credit classes. And if you're not familiar how that works, basically you go to the high school in the morning. I went to Athens. And then um, that morning or afternoon, whenever your classes were scheduled, you go to the campus of TVCC. And I don't know if that's still how they work things. But um, so I was at the campus of TVCC. I didn't have a phone. My parents had no way to get a hold of me, and you know, if I was at the high school, they could always call the high school if they needed me, but whenever I was on the campus um, at the college, there was really no way for them to get a hold of me. And, and my dad used to tell me and my brother, um, your sins will find you out. And that was like the scariest phrase, because you think, I don't want you to find out my sins. And, and I, didn't even, you know, I didn't even know if that was actually in the Bible at the time, but he always told me that's in the Bible. And later on, I went and looked it up, and it is, it's in the Bible. So just so you know, it's truth, your sins will find you out. Um, but I remember, and this is God, this is just how you know that that passage of scripture will come to pass in your life at some point or another. But I was on the campus and I had to get a paper signed. And it was just one of those, I didn't have to get a lot of papers signed in high school, but you know, when you do, you have to have it signed and I need to turn it in that day. And so I went and found a phone from my friend or the campus. I don't remember where I was. I think I actually went into the registrar's office to use their phone. And, um, I called my dad and I was like, dad, I need this paper signed. And he was like, okay, I'll meet you at Walmart. 
And so I drive to Walmart, and I get to Walmart, and <laughs> he's there with my youth pastor. And so it's him and my youth pastor, and they're just sitting in the parking lot, and they had ridden together in his car. And I thought, oh, this doesn't look good. Like, you, you know, when, as a kid or a person, you pull up and you just know something's not right right now. So I pull up, and very few words were exchanged in that moment, but he said, I, I need you to ride home with me. Um, your youth pastor is going to take your car. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what is happening? And I was like, you, you don't want me to take my car? He's like, no, I want you to ride with me. And that's a very scary moment when your dad tells you to get in the car with you and you have no way of escaping. It's just you and him and you know something's not right. So I get in the car with him and we are driving home. I don't even get to go back to school that day. I, I, so that's how you know something's up when they don't let you go back to school. Um, we're in the car and, he's, and he, sa he says this to me. And if you're a teenager, you know this is probably one of the most scary, scary phrases that your parent will ever say to you. He said... I want you to tell me everything that you ever did. And I was just like, okay, how can I say this in a way that he doesn't know everything, but then he also doesn't figure out that I'm lying. And so you have to strategically figure out what he knows and what he doesn't know. And so we're in the car and I'm just like, all in this moment, I'm just, everything is just dropping. I'm like, okay, I've done a lot of stuff. And so what is it that he knows? And I, I don't even remember everything that I told him in the car. I don't think in that moment, we exchanged everything that had happened in that car. But basically, what, it, what had happened is in high school, I, I kind of lived this double life. I, I was at church on the weekend. You know, we lived here in Athens, so we had this church. We were at the Arboretum, and, um, and you know, I, I was the good church girl. But then on the weekends, whenever I was hanging out with the friends that weren't right for me, we would go to parties, and we would drink, and, um, and we would talk about sneaking out. I don't think I ever actually did that, but there were talks of it. And, and you know, I, I lived this life that wasn't right. And, and that day, I guess my, my youth pastors had found out some things. Some of my friends went to my youth pastors and said, hey, Anna's doing some things that you need to know about. And, and so my youth pastors, you know, being the youth pastors that they were, and I think this is important, that they went to my parents and they told my parents, and, and, you know, back then I don't see that as something that was a good thing, but now I look back and think, wow, that was God's grace, that he was rescuing me from a life that he didn't want me to walk down. And I, so we got home, and my youth pastor showed up later at our house with my car, and my dad, before, while we were waiting, um, he, we were sitting in my room, and he said, I want you to write out a list of everything that you did. And, and so I did, I wrote out everything. I mean, like came clean about everything. And um, he, he sat on my bed after that and he read the list. And you know, he, he, he used to say this thing to me and you know, my parents said this to me and my brother. He, they always said, this too shall pass. And in the moment you think this is never gonna be over. This is, this is the longest day of my life and this is gonna, I'm, I'm never gonna get over this. And, you know, here I am, you know, 25, nine years later, nine or ten years later, and, and it did. It passed. You know, those moments passed. But I remember sitting on my bed next to my dad, and, and if you know him any, if you know him well, you know he doesn't really listen to music a lot. If you get into his truck, it's going to be Fox News. We were just talking about this the other day. It's going to be either Fox News or it's going to be, like, Comedy Central or something that he's listening to on his Sirius XM. So it's not, he, it's not ever music. So whenever he pulled out his phone and he was like, and I have a song I want to play for you, you know it's like, okay, this is going to be, like, a powerful moment or something because when he pulls out a song. And so I remember the song, and, and I remember the song – of forgiveness and how the spirit and the song talked about how the spirit would basically God would open up the heavens and pull, pour out his spirit and and it was just one of those moments where I realized the love of a father and not just an earthly father but how much you know even through all of my my sin and my wickedness you know that God the father loved me still in that moment and um and so I just I, I want to I want to show you guys how beautiful confession is and there are consequences to the things that we do. But when we confess our sins, just how much God still loves us. So I want you guys to turn to two passages of scripture, because that's what we do around here. It just wouldn't be a weekend at life if we didn't turn to two passages of scripture. So the first one is Luke 15, and we'll start there. And then I want you to turn to Psalms 32, and that's where we'll end today. <clears throat> so Luke chapter 15, verse 11, and I want to open up the, 
the sermon with this passage because I think it shows the beauty of a father's love and, and not just an earthly father, but the, the, the love of a father in heaven. So Luke 15, chapter, or verse 11 says, he also said a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the carob pods the pigs were eating, but no one would give him any. When he came to his senses, and I think there was a moment in my life where I came to my senses, and I think there's a moment in all of our lives where it's like we come to our senses, finally. God, God gets to us. He said, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, and here I am dying of hunger? I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I've sinned against, one of your hire, I've sinned against heaven in your, in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his slaves, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast. Because this, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You know what I love? There's two things I love about this story, especially love about this story. It says that when the son was still a long way off, the father saw him and ran to him. You know, I think there's a lot of us in this room who may feel that way. We feel like we're still a long way off and there's no room for forgiveness for us. And you can say, well, you don't know what I did last night. But the truth is, God knows what you did last night and he's still running and pursuing you no matter what foolish living that you found yourself in. And the second part I love about this is that twice the son says, I I'm not worthy to be called your son. And the father, it's almost like immediately ignores what he has to say. It says, I'm not, I'm not even worthy to be called your son, but the father told his slaves, quick, bring out the best robe and put a ring on him and let's celebrate and have a party. It, it's in that moment, it's like the father wasn't even, just immediate forgiveness came from the father of this story. And that's how the father in heaven feels about you. You know, he's just waiting for you to come home, for you to say, God, I messed up. And, and in that moment, it's like, God's just throwing a party in heaven because you decided to do that. So I have three points for you guys. The first one is confession saves. And I, I find it interesting that the very first thing that we have to do to become a believer is confess. And I think that if that's the very first thing that we have to do as a believer, how important is it that we keep doing it throughout our entire life as believers? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. But I think we always stop there at Romans 10, 9, and 10. But if you keep reading, it's, it's awesome how God responds to us. In verses 11 through 13, he says, Now the scripture says, Everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. He's rich to all who call on him. We're, on even, we're in an even playing field here. Everyone is born into sin and everyone is a sinner. And, and yet God sees us all the same. And it says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. It doesn't matter what you did. It, it doesn't matter if you committed murder. God loves you. You know, I, I don't want you to hear me wrong here because I think that this could be taken, you know, communication sometimes. You, you hear something that wasn't said. Salvation happens one time. When you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you are saved. And that happens one time. But there's a process after that, a process of sanctification. 
in a process of having confessed a lot of sins over our lifetime. And, you know, the, the word sanctification basically means that we are becoming more like God or becoming holy, moving towards becoming holy. And I don't know about you, maybe you had one of those, like, miraculous moments whenever you got saved and just, like, you made a 180 overnight. That wasn't me. <laughs> I hear stories like that, and they say, I got saved, and I've never been the same again. And, you know, I think there are situations like that. But for me, I, I felt like I had to work. <laughs> I had to confess some things and get sanctified, and I'm still being sanctified and still trying to work out this life of salvation. And, and, it's, and I, I want you to hear me clearly, it's not about works, because you, you get saved in that one moment, and that's it. But th there's such a process of learning how to become intimate with the Father, and learning how to know what his heart is, and his heart's desires, and, and there's nothing you could do to ever make him love you more, or love you less. But, you know, th there's a verse that talks about, do, is it, do we have grace so that we can go on and sin more? No. We have grace so that we can have the power to walk out this life and we can overcome sin. And so I, I just encourage you that no matter if you need to make that step today where you make that first confession, where you say, God, I've never even confessed that you're my Lord, that's step one. But as a, for us believers, we don't get out so easily. There's a process where we have to confess sins almost daily because we're so imperfect. So my first point is confession saves. My second point is confession heals. And I, I think this is two parts. I think that you can have, you can confess your sins and you can be healed physically. Because I think sometimes God's asking us to go back and do the, the thing that he asked us to do a long time ago, what we never did. You know, we keep praying for healing, a physical healing. God, take this away from me, take this pain away from me. And God's like, but you're holding bitterness. I think God's more concerned about our spiritual healing than he is about our physical healing. And so if there's something you're holding on to, there's a, there's a spiritual healing, and he's more concerned about your heart than he is your, your leg or your arm that needs to be healed. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I, or sorry, skipped ahead. Psalm 32, 3 says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. When he kept silent about his sin, he wasted away. I've been there where I knew I did something wrong and I just for weeks was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm a horrible person. And you just feel like you're wasting away because you're this horrible person. That, and what's so great about confession is it heals you from that. It heals you from that wasting away. And I think we wake up every morning and think, God, how could you love me? And yet God says that his mercies are new every single morning. But it's that sin and that darkness that's inside of us that helps, that makes us wake up in the morning and think that there isn't mercy. James 5.16, this is the good news. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. That's good news. And you know, my... My, my message today is going to be mainly about confessing your sins to God. But there's a point where God's going to say, I need you to go tell something, some, somebody, a person face to face that you did something wrong. I'm going to need you to confess your sins to one another. And that's not easy. <laughs> that's probably harder to confess your sins one, to one another than it is to actually confess to God because we know God will love us. Or at least I'd like to think that. But confessing your sins to one another could result in, well, what if they never forgive me? What if they hate me for the rest of my life? What if I lose a friend? What if I lose a teammate? If they found out what I did, you don't know what I did, but if they found out, I, I, I would lose so many people. Can I just tell you, from my perspective anyways, and I can't say this for every single believer, but for me, I know how much I've been forgiven of. I know how bad of a person I am, and I know how much sin that I had in my life that God had to save me from. And when a person comes to me and says, hey, I did this, will you forgive me, or will you pray for me? I just needed to talk to somebody. There's zero judgment in my heart, because 
I know what I had to go through, and I know that God had to die on a cross for a really wicked person, a really bad person who had a lot of darkness. And I'm hoping I'm speaking for all believers here that you realize just how much God saved you from. That whenever somebody comes and puts their hand in your hand, they say, hey, I screwed up. You can look at them with the grace of the Father and say, you know what? It'll be okay. We'll get past this. That's my prayer for believers, is that we can have such a unity in the body that we realize that we are all screwed up. (laughs) I mean, can I just have a show of hands? How many of you are sinners in the room? Anybody messed up? (laughs) Yeah. So I think this is a pretty safe place. A couple of weeks ago, when I was preaching at youth, I had them stand up, and, and we held hands all the way across the sanctuary. And we're going through a series on prayer right now, and we prayed together. And what I found so interesting is that in the Bible, God's last prayer, you know, when he was praying before he ascended into heaven, he, he prayed for believers. He pl- prayed for you and I, the disciples. And in that prayer, he prayed, I, I pray that they become one as you and I are one as God the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. Because the Bible says that others will know me by their love for one another. And so at youth, we held hands, and as they were holding hands, I told them, I started praying against the spirit of pride. Because I told them, I said, listen, if anybody walked in this room and they have this spirit of elitism where they think that they're better than somebody else, I said, you can leave. Because we're not about that. We're not going to be known as a youth group who somebody walks in and they're better than somebody else. We're just not about that here. God sees us all the same. We're all sinners. And God loves us so much for who we are as a person. And so I hope that we can say the same here. And I, I believe we can because I've never been to a church where there's so much love and family than there is here. I asked God this week, when I was praying about this point, um, why, is it, why is it so important that we confess our sins so that we can be healed? And I felt like he gave me this picture. How many of you are parents and have kids? Okay, so you guys are, hopefully somebody in this room is going to get this. How many of you have ever had kids who come home from a sleepover and they bring, maybe they went swimming over the summer or something, and they bring home a Walmart bag full of wet clothes that's been tied up for like three days. <laughs> Anybody? Okay. <laughs> you know that when you open that bag, you are just like, like turning your head because you know it is not going to smell good. I believe that that is exactly what it looks like to not confess our sins because we're born into choice. So our sins are in this plastic bag, our heart, and we have it all tied up and sealed off from fresh air and from light. And it sits in there for days or weeks, and it becomes worse and worse and starts smelling worse and worse. By the time you open that bag, you think, let's just burn it because it's not going to, we're never going to get that smell out. And I, I think that's where we sit sometimes. But here's the great news about that. We have a choice. We have a choice to open up our Walmart bag, and God the Father sees those stinky clothes, and he's like, I'm going to take care of that. We're going to wash that all up, and we're going to cleanse it, and we're going to make it righteous again. That is what confession looks like. And some of us have been carrying around this Walmart bag full of stinky, wet clothes, wet sins, bad things. And God's just saying, open it up. I'm going to take care of it. Don't worry. So I I just, I pray that that's the point that we get to. And I, I want to read this last verse about this. 1 John 1, 7 through 9 says, but if we walk in the light, As he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is is good for all of you who think that you're the only one who has sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. Yeah, that just goes to show you right there. The Bible says we're all sinners. You can't even say you don't have sin or you'll be deceiving yourself. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful to open up that bag and cleanse you. He's so faithful. That's why confession is such a beautiful thing because it's not about who you are. It's not about what you did. It's about how faithful he is and how he can save you from all of that unrighteousness. My last point is this, confession releases. 
And this is where I think the, that the most joy comes from confession. I, I had this picture during worship about somebody who was carrying around a lot of weight. I just picture sandbags on your shoulder. That's, that's a lot of weight to carry around. And God says in Hebrews 12 to strip off the sin that so easily entangles us and to run with endurance. It's really hard to run when you have weight and when you have sandbags on your shoulders. But God is saying, strip it off and run with endurance. Run. It's really hard to run and receive God's mercy whenever we're carrying around the baggage of sin. But confession releases us. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. You know, that's a scary thought. David wrote this, and he says, if I regard wickedness. That means if he knew that wickedness was there, if he was walking around and he blatantly knew that he had sin, the Lord would not hear. And it's not that the Lord can't hear when there's sin. It's that the Lord's saying, I want to teach you a lesson through this, and if you don't go back and fix what was wrong spiritually, we can't move forward from here. We've got to, you've got to get rid of the baggage. You want to live a lifestyle that's, that's light and free, but you've got to go back to that last time when I told you to get rid of that baggage so that, so that we can move on from here. Proverbs 28, 13 says, The one who conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. That's, that's a release right there. To understand that you can come to the throne of God and confess your sins and receive mercy. He's not going to put shame on you. He's not going to condemn you. The Bible says that there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you come to him, there's a release. There's a mercy and a grace for you when you need it the most. I was in my bathroom the other day, and I, I've been telling the other services that I hear God most in two places, usually when I'm getting ready in the morning or in my car. I don't know if it's just because I'm by myself and there's nothing going on other than just me and the Lord. But I was getting ready the other morning, and, and a song worthy of your name came on. And I, we sing it here, and the... The bridge to that song, I wanted to read it to you guys because there was just something, I had a revelation moment. I'm going to read this and I'm going to tell you what God told me. The bridge of that song, it's by Passion Worship. It says, you're my author, my maker, my ransom, my savior, my refuge, my hiding place. You're my helper and my healer, my blessed redeemer, my answer, my saving grace. You're my hope in the shadows my strength in the battle, my anchor for all my days. And you stood, and you stand by my side, and you stood by my, in my place, Jesus, no other name, only Jesus, no other name. And as I was standing there in my bathroom, I felt like as the lyrics of that song came on, God highlighted, you're my hiding place. And I just thought, wow, why is confession so scary when God in his Bible and in his word and the truth of God says, I'll be your hiding place? I think sometimes we think God's going to throw us under the bus when we come and confess something to him. He's going to completely derail our lives. He, we're going to lose friends and he's gonna, we're going to mess up because we confess something. But God says, no, I'm your hiding place. I'm your strength in the battle. Come to me, all you are weary, and I will give you rest. That's our God, and that's what he wants to do for you. I, I want to close with Psalm 32, so if you're in your Bibles, please turn there. It's, it's one of those verses where we read it earlier. I said, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. We read verse 3 of that, but I encourage you, when a verse is read, go look at the context of the entire passage, because we could look at that and think, wow, you know, David kept silent about his sin, his body wasted away. But if you look at this passage, it's, it's a message of God's redemption and David confessing something to God. So Psalm 32, verse 1, says, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is the man the Lord does not charge with sin, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, and my strength was drained as in the summer's heat. 
Then I acknowledged my sin. I confessed my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you took away the guilt of my sin. That's that release. He takes it away. Therefore, let everyone who is faithful pray to you at a time that you may be found. When great floodwaters come, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with joyful shouts of deliverance. That's our Father. That's what happens when you confess your sin. I think we think it's scary, but God's saying, if you confess to me, I'm going to surround you with joyful songs. I'm going to deliver you. So earlier I told you about the story where I didn't do confession so well, and I kind of just got found out. Here's a better way to do confession. My last year at ORU, I graduated, and it was the summer after um, 2014, the summer of 2014, and I was looking for a job because every college student, once you get out, my mom even told me, she was like, Anna, just take your time, you know, have fun over the summer, but you, you're just like, if I don't get a job, I'm never going to have a life, I'm never going to have money, and you just like immediately start trying to find a job. Now I look back and I think, dang, I should just taken that whole summer, <laughs> not done anything. <laughs> but that summer after, I knew I wanted to work here. It was just in my heart. I had a passion for this place. I had basically been raised here. We moved here when I was 13, and this was the place I knew. I loved this place, and I wanted to work here, and this is where I wanted to start my life. But I had some baggage. You know, I, I messed up in high school, and we think we get perfect at some point. I don't, I don't know why we think that, but in college, I messed up even more. <laughs> and I had that baggage that I was carrying and I told myself, I can't come into this job with baggage. I need to lay it out, not only before my dad, but who could potentially be my boss. And he needs to know the groundwork. He needs to know what he's dealing with. He needs to know the real person that I am. And so before I started working here, I came to my dad, and I came into his office, and I sat on the couch. And for those of you who know me or my mom, we're just criers. We, we cry about everything. And so I just immediately sat down and started bawling, like couldn't even see through all the tears. And I told him the things that I'd done at ORU and just how messed up I was. And, you know, the devil will lie to you and say that when you confess those kind of things, that you'll be completely disowned or you won't get the job or they'll fire you if they only knew who you were. But in that moment, when I came to my dad and I, I confessed the things that I had done, he just hugged me. It was just a moment where he hugged me. He said, Anna, we'll get past this. Everything's going to be OK. This too shall pass. And you know, that's how the Heavenly Father is when we come to him. Don't listen to the lies that whenever you confess your sins, your life is over. When you confess what you did, and I, I want to be very clear, there are consequences to your sin. But sometimes the consequences are just grace. I think we look at consequences and we think, we don't want to have to go through those. But if I didn't have to go through the consequences of my sin, I wouldn't learn what I know today. I wouldn't be who the person I am today. And God allows us to go through those consequences because he's teaching us. And so, I, you know, Hebrews 4, verse 16 says, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. It was always known by me and my brother that my, my dad's office was already always open for us. We never had to make an appointment with my dad. We could always just go directly into his office anytime we wanted. And that's how the Father is with you guys. You don't have to make an appointment with God. You don't have to tell God that you'll meet with him next week. You can approach him boldly today. You can walk right into his sanctuary, right into the inner courts. That's why he died, and that's why the veil was torn right down the middle for you to walk in anytime you wanted to. Because he wants to hear from his children, even if you have some bad stuff to tell him. <laughs> 